All right. If you've ever broken a bone, I want you to stand up for a second here. Okay, some of them are proud of it. They got right up. Okay. All right, if you've ever had a major surgery of some kind, uh, go ahead and uh, stand up. No, no, stand up, broken bone people. Uh, okay, major surgery of some kind, uh, uh, stand up. Okay, if you've ever had 10 stitches or more, 10 stitches or more of some kind, had to go... Yeah, that happened to Rob? Okay. Wow, this is amazing. I really had no idea what would happen when I said this. Okay. Wow. Yeah, young and old. Mostly old. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the older we get, I guess our odds of uh, something happening uh, increase, right? I, this, I, uh, anybody with knife wounds? Did I, did I call out that one? Oh, good. We've got some new, we got some new ones. We've got knife wounds. Uh, anybody with a gunshot wound? Uh, Kaz down at the ER and the orthopedic group, and they're always, he's always seeing uh, knife, uh, gun wounds as well. Quite a group. It looks like well over half, if not two-thirds, of you are standing. Okay, have a seat. Physical wounds. We're talking about physical wounds here. This morning, I want us to think about this in terms of our hidden wounds. Max, go to the next uh, slide, how God heals your hidden wounds. And of course, Joplin is a real problem in terms of the grief and the pain and the devastation and the leveling of that area that's just larger than we can imagine, and I hope the video footage began to help us see just how wide and long it was and is. And yet, in some ways, and this morning, I want us to think about the devastation there as a metaphor for the woundedness in our own hearts. And so I want you to think this morning, and it might be a little hard for some of you, and I can appreciate that. And it might be more of a journey, and, and, and the more I got to thinking about it, I was like, why did I only leave myself two weeks? This is probably a six-week or six-month kind of thing. So we're just going to talk about it for a couple of weeks, but maybe it'll help, and it'll be an encouragement. Maybe it'll be an encouragement for some of you to take the next step and go to celebrate and recovery. But I want you to think for a minute this morning, Max, next slide, about our memories, about resentments, sins. And so often, interestingly, as it relates to our wound, there is sin that is all interrelated to our woundedness. So many of us who have been wounded then become ones who wound others. And the scripture says it's sin. We've been sinned against and we're perpetuating this. Sometimes consciously, sometimes not so consciously, sometimes in one form, not in the form it was expressed to us. It all gets sort of wound in there together. And couldn't you feel that as we read that passage from Jeremiah? On the one hand, it's about lament and grief and hurt. But on the other hand, it's about unfaithfulness and sin. Well, which is it? Yes. It all gets tied in together. It's about our regrets and our worries and our fears. Because most of the conflict we have isn't really about toast or dinner or the toilet paper. At a much deeper level, when you begin to uncover the onion, it's related to our anxiety and to our fear and to our identity. 
And then compulsions, addictions. Well, where do we get the hidden wounds? I mean, some of it goes all the way back to school. I remember, I can remember very distinctly about third grade playing football. And I remember out in the, uh, at, at lunch, and, and, and uh, right after lunch, out in the uh, field there, and at the school, and one of the kids calling me crate face. Now, crate face, you know, isn't really all that bad. I mean, I mean, how could that hurt? You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Is that really true? Now, how is it that, I have to do the math, but 35, 40 years later, I still remember what he called me. School, okay, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's a neighbor, sometimes it's society, sometimes it was a teammate, sometimes it's the wound of prejudice. May we've been prejudiced against because of the language that you speak like you speak Tennessean or something, and then you come to Missouri and people mock you, you know. Does that happen, Gwen? Okay, yeah, okay. Or, or maybe because of your ethnic background or because you're a, a woman. The color of your skin, I know that hurts. And it hurts deeply. You know, I want to take it to another level this morning because I think our deepest wounds, most often, we could all figure this one out, is related to family. Parents and partners and exes and brothers and sisters they hurt us deeply and i would suggest that just as we stand for stood for a minute ago for our physical wounds i would bet in this audience Nearly everyone, if not everyone, has hidden wounds. And those hidden wounds are much, much, much harder to heal than the physical ones that we just stood for. Most physical wounds heal and, you know, unless you got my gimpy knee, which, you know, you, you kind of forget about it after a passage of time. Well, I want to tell you, and the theme of our verse this morning, and it's from Psalm 147 in verse 3, and I like this translation, and let's put the verse up there again. God heals bandages their wounds I want to suggest just a few steps in how he does that this morning and we'll finish with some of this next week and, and, and all of that I would describe it as an onion where to a great degree we will only be uh, skimming the surface and taking a couple layers of the onion and the first step is I must admit my hurt. And I noticed that we didn't have too much trouble doing that as it related to our physical wounds and things that we've healed of from the past. But you're never going to get well until you face your feelings straight on. And holding on to a hurt is like this super hot chili pepper that's inside of your mouth and you're holding it and it's going to burn you up on the inside. You say, well, time heals everything. And I would suggest to you that that's basically a lie. Amen. 
What if you have cancer today? Does time help? If you've got cancer, you want to do something about the cancer before it takes over and runs you into the ground until you die. What if you were in a car accident this morning and you lost part of your leg? Will it just get better with time? I would suggest to you that you find your way, Brett, to the hospital and get it attended to. So in Psalm 39, David says this, I kept very quiet, but when I was silent and still, not saying anything good, he was keeping it in. He was holding it in. He was holding it tight. He was holding on to his hidden wounds. And it says, my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. There's the chili pepper. And as I meditated, the fire burned. In his case, it turned into the seething anger that was boiling inside. Now, I have a theory, and that is, it is this, that some of you are tired mostly all the time. And, and some of that might be because you don't get enough sleep. And some of it because you might be overly committed. But for some of you, I want to suggest that you're just tired of being sick and tired all the time, and it's because you are using up so much of your emotional energy on things that have happened in the past. these emotional wounds. And they're dragging you down. And so you tr you're doing, you're, you're, you're without even consciously doing it sometimes on a subconscious or unconscious level, you're, you're kind of trying to cope with all of this, press it down, and so it leads to addictions. And it leads to medications and it leads to TV, the other medication, and to food, and to gambling, and to sex, and to relationships, and to getting super busy, all as ways that are not very appropriate or very good at attending to that inner hurt. And so I want to suggest this morning that revealing your feelings is the beginning. And you've got to be honest in three relationships. With God, with yourself, and with someone else. God, self, someone else. First, to be honest with God, and as uh, John said last week, we might want to say it differently, but we have to say sometimes, God, life stinks. God, I'm in pain. God, it's not fair. God can handle your anger. I want you to know this morning, he was weeping with you when you were weeping. He saw of your abuse. He saw the pain. He saw what you went through when you experienced shame. And he was there with you weeping. And so the call is to, for you to be honest with the God who already knows. And it is cleansing to admit it. And then you have to be honest with yourself because these hurts hurt. And so it's so hard to be really come face to face with the person in the mirror. Not minimizing it in any way. And then I want you to be honest with at least essential James chapter 5 and verse 16, most of us know the verse gives us the hint, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
And I think it would be fair to add along to that, confess your wounds, your hurts to one another. Revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. When someone comes up to me and they, they, they say, uh, uh, Jeff, I've just got to get this off my chest. Now usually it's loaded. Okay? But I want to train myself in that moment more and more to start to be hopeful. Because almost regardless of what they have to say and what they're thinking and feeling at that moment, what they're really trying to say is, I've got something I've got to release and talk to someone about this. And for many people, when that happens, they're going to experience a freedom that they have not experienced before, maybe a freedom for the very first time. And that's the reason I want to invite it and feel hopeful about it. Opening the secret closet and letting somebody know. I look for the origin of who said this, but I think it's a profound statement. You're only as sick as your secrets. And actually it was Anonymous. Anonymous said this. He said a lot of good things through the years. <laughs> we don't really know. But you're only as sick as your secrets. I would like you to reflect on that this week if you're struggling with a hit. We're still getting some uh, fading in and out. I'm not sure why it's doing that this morning. We've a new, a new problem, but uh, we'll, we'll deal with it. You're only as sick as your secrets. All right. Point two, we're going to need to move this along. I must release my offenders. You've got to let it go. You can't get along well if you have resentment in your heart. And this whole bit about forgiveness is commanded, of course, but it's for our benefit. It's for our well-being. For your own sake, you've got to let it go. Because can you really get even anyway? Again, you only have a certain amount of emotional energy. If you're going to use your emotional energy, are you going to use it to get even? Or to get well? I doubt whether you have enough to do both. There's only one way to take away your pain, and that is forgiveness. Offering it and asking for it. You've got to let them off the hook. I like the idea that someone owes you if they've sinned against you, and now it's time to cancel the debt. Cancel what is owed. Well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Nobody does. But you do it because you want to get on with your life. And I think maybe we have a hard time with that because we don't, at the end of the day, trust that God really did see it. Everything that hurt us. The Lord Jesus Christ understood abuse. He was wounded in his head when they crushed a crown of thorns into his skull. 
He was wounded in his hands and feet when they nailed him to a cross. He was wounded in his side when they stuck the spear into his side. He was wounded on his back when they gave him 40 lashes with a cat of nine tails. But by far the deepest wounds of Jesus were not physical. They were the hidden wounds of betrayal and rejection and hatred and humiliation and prejudice. If you've ever experienced any of those, Jesus says, I understand. And then thirdly, we replace old lies with God's truth. We'll develop this just a little bit more next week, but what I want you to hear is this. We replay these tapes in our mind over and over and over again, and, and we, our minds are like a sophisticated garbage dump. All of this stuff goes in there. We see it, we record it. We can't always recall it, particularly for those of us who, you know, get to about 50. But it's in there. And it's working its way. And so we remember messages like this. You're not very coordinated. You're never going to be good at math. You'll probably always have to struggle with your weight. Nobody really likes you. You're shy, aren't you? You don't really have much to offer. Why can't you be like your brother? I'm embarrassed by you. What I want to say this morning is that those are lies and God's truth is the truth that will set you free. But it will require you taking it on and allowing it to reform this com sophisticated computer system. Allowing God, as the passage has said, to heal your memories. To ask God this week, God, will you help me in healing my memories? Memories of rejection and of sin and resentment and guilt and abuse and hateful words. And so we then fill our minds with this truth of God that will set us free. And the more you let it go in and go deep, the more it pushes the garbage out and replaces it with something that is healthy. The more you do that, the healthier you'll be. Now what does God say about you? And we're going to hear this from Gwen in just a minute. That's a whole series in, of itself, but I want you to see one verse, Ephesians 1 and verse 4. Through what Christ would do for us, God decided to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We stand before him covered with his love. Replace the old tape with this new podcast. Let it take over the inner workings of your brain and your heart. Admit your hurt, release your offenders, replace the old tape with God's truth.